Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about the announcement that Canon has finally let Tamron and Sigma make lenses for the RF mount, kind of. I'm pleased to announce that I'm launching three Capture One style packs, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder. These will eventually also be available for Lightroom, so if you go to kevindealphotography.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and join my mailing list, I promise I won't send you spam, but I will let you know the second these release. And now, on to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews, tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button below. So if you are on the Canon RF mount and you've been on it for longer than say five seconds, chances are you've gone into a Facebook group, you've gone onto a forum online, and you've stumbled upon a conversation that talks about the fact that Canon will not let other companies make lenses for their mount. However, that changes today because the announcement came down that both Sigma and Tamron are now finally entering into the RF game, kind of. It is with the caveat that it is only for their APS-C body. So today is an amazing day if you shoot on an R7, if you shoot on an R50, an R10, an R100. Today is an awesome day for you because the lenses that have been announced are very awesome lenses. I would know because I own three of them. I shoot the Sigma Contemporary lenses on the Fuji X-Mount. We'll get more into that in a minute. But they also announced a 10 to 18 and an 18 to 50 millimeter lens with a maximum aperture of 2.8 and then those aforementioned contemporary prime lenses have maximum apertures of 1.4. That's pretty awesome when you compare it to those RFS lenses, which are like f4.5 to f5.6 or 6.3s. You're getting a lot more light transmission out of these lenses. So that is something to keep in mind. But they are not the only ones at this party. Tamron also announced an 11 to 20 millimeter 2.8. And we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. But let's start with Sigma. So check this lens out. This is a 56 millimeter 1.4. This is a pretty cool lens. 1.4 uh, and 56 millimeters, that's pretty close to your nifty 50. So this is a 50 millimeter 1.8 and this is a 56 millimeter 1.4. They're roughly the same size, a little bit bigger on the 56 millimeter 1.4, but 1.4 is two thirds of a stop brighter than 1.8. So if you're thinking about a situation where you have your shutter speed at 1 60th of a second on this lens, you could have it at 1 100th of a second on this lens. And then the fact that it does go to 1.4 means that you're gonna have a pretty good shallow depth of field. And this is more or less your 85 millimeter in the APS-C world. Now you go over to the other side of the spectrum, this is a 1.4. 85 millimeter and this is a 1.456 millimeter now this is going to have a much more shallow depth of field no doubt but in terms of light transmission you're talking about a 1.4 versus 1.2 that's only a third stop difference so you can get a very compact setup you can get really good portraits you can let in a lot of light for this tiny little lens now I have to speculate on price because Sigma doesn't even make this lens the same price for every mount. It's cheaper for Sony than it is for Fuji. I'm assuming they have to pay licensing fees to Fuji and I'm assuming that's also going to be the same for Canon. And so I'm guessing this is probably gonna be in that $400 price range. That remains to be seen. Moving on to the 16 millimeter 1.4. This lens is amazing. It's incredibly sharp. It's more or less a 26, 27 millimeter when you take that 1.6 crop factor into consideration. And when you compare it to the Canon, yes, this is way bigger, but you're talking about a 2.8 versus a 1.4. You're talking about a two stop difference. And you can actually see bokeh at a 1.4. It's pretty hard to see bokeh at a 2.8 on a 16 millimeter. Uh, but this lens is going to be awesome for storytelling. This lens is going to be awesome for some landscapes. It's not an ultra wide. You probably need to go to some of the zooms we're going to talk about in today's episode if you're going to do landscape seriously. But Really cool lens, really sharp lens. And yes, it looks larger. This is on my X-T20, but in all honesty, when you compare this to Canon full-frame lenses, none of these lenses are large. 
They also announced a 23 millimeter 1.4. I don't own that lens in the contemporary line, but I wanted to make sure you knew it existed. It's kind of ironic because it presents like a 35 millimeter. And one of the sore spots in the Canon RF lineup is the fact that they don't have an RF 35 millimeter that's any brighter than 1.8. Then there's also the 30 millimeter 1.4, and you can compare it to this 35 millimeter 1.8. Once again, a two thirds stops difference. This one's a little bit longer. This one has image stabilization. This one does not have image stabilization. It should also be noted that none of these lenses have image stabilization uh, that Sigma makes, and I don't even think the Tamron does either, so that's something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that these Sigma contemporary lenses, they don't have switches for autofocus and manual focus. They do not have control rings, but they do have very large focus rings. So depending on what's important to you, that could be significant, but it may be kind of annoying to have to switch these lenses from manual to autofocus. Now, Maybe they'll have switches on them, but I doubt it because I think all Sigma is doing here is chopping off the end, putting a new mount on it, doing a little bit of R&D on the algorithm, and that's pretty much it. So I wouldn't expect anything more than that. If there is anything more than that to these lenses and they can keep the prices the same as Fuji, that would be a pretty significant development. Probably the most significant thing about these contemporary lenses is that they do claim to have dust and splash resistance, which is something that the Canon RF lenses don't claim to have at all unless they're L lenses. These lenses right here are not weather resistant according to Canon. So that's something that is a significant development in the RF lineup is that you can now get non L lenses that are weather resistant. In the case of the Tamron 11 to 20, it claims to be weather sealed. So that is a significant development. If you're a landscape, photographer and maybe you need to go get an 11 to 20 which I think is what a 17 or an 18 millimeter to roughly a 35 that's pretty good for landscapes and now you have a weather sealed lens you could pair that up with something like an r7 and you could have a weather sealed setup in an APS-C form factor. It wouldn't be nearly as large as hauling around your 14 to 35 and your R5, and you could get some pretty good results with that setup and of course all that comes down to your budget. The 10 to 18, that's kind of a 16 to 28 millimeter in full frame with a constant maximum aperture of 2.8. That's pretty significant. They also have an 18 to 50 millimeter, which is a 28 to 80 equivalent also with a maximum aperture of 2.8. So those are good general walk around lenses and 2.8 is going to give you pretty good light transmission. So definitely something you don't want to overlook there. I would say the biggest surprise is the fact that Tamron didn't announce the 17 to 70 2.8 because I have this for Fuji. And if you do the math on it, 17 to 70, that's about a 24 to 105 2.8. And when you see that Canon makes a 24 to 105 2.8 and it's $3,000, then you could get a Tamron a 17 to 70 2.8 for about seven eight hundred dollars that could be a significant game changer in the world of canon and that might be why we haven't seen it announced now keep in mind the 2.8 on this is not the same as the 2.8 on the 24 to 105 full frame version but in terms of light transmission it is the same it's just the depth of field is different so i do hope to see a 17 to 70 down the pipeline but i think this announcement is pretty simple and that these companies are like oh cool we're open up for it let's take something we already have chop the end off uh, change the algorithm. I do hold out hope that we could possibly see some full frame versions of some of these lenses someday, but I think these companies are playing it safe. They're tiptoeing into the RF mount. They're filling a market need that is empty right now because Canon doesn't seem to be able to pump out RFS lenses or they're just not taking RFS lenses that seriously. So this does fill a market need. Hopefully these companies will rake in the revenue and we'll see some full frame equivalents of them down the road. That does it for today's episode. I hope each and every one of you found this to be useful. I hope you found it to be helpful. Uh, what do you think about this announcement of the Sigma contemporary lenses? I know a bunch of you full framers are going to be upset about it, but it is a step in the right direction from where I stand. Uh, if you like what you saw, tell me about it in the comments below. I humbly ask you to click the subscribe button below. If you like this channel, you like my opinions, my uncensored opinions on photography and videography related subjects, I highly recommend you to check out my other YouTube channel, the F11 Photography Podcast. There's also an audio version of available on Apple and Spotify. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.